All right, now, um, tonight we're going to be starting something that, that I haven't done a series before, but we're going to be doing a series on Sunday night, just a few weeks. There's a topic, it's just, it's such a big topic that I have to split it up, and I'm going to cover it in multiple sermons. And um, what we're going to be talking about is the family, okay? The family is critical. The family is, is, is an establishment, God established the family, um, as, as its own authority structure and its own entity, essentially, God has established, he establishes families, he establishes government, and he establishes the church as, as like different areas in our life. And, um, and the family is extremely important. That family is under attack these days, especially. I mean, you see, you know, divorce rates are through the roof. Kids are getting more and more wicked at much more younger ages. There's a lot of wickedness going on, and, and the world is just pumping their agenda of, of how a family should be, and, and they're really just doing a good job of brainwashing people out there into thinking that the family should be something different, much, much different than what the Bible explains. So as we go through this series, I'm taking one week to talk about the wives, I'm taking one week to talk about the husbands, and I'm taking one week to talk about the children. Okay, the three main aspects of a family. So tonight, we're going to start with the wives. So once you get over this, wives, you're going to have it easy for the next couple of weeks. Right? <laughs> but we're going to get through this. And, and look, every role is very, very important. The family is made up. It's not just one person. It's not just two people. A family is made up. I mean, if you don't have children, it's going to be your family is the husband and wife. But if you do have children, it, it, it's composed of everybody. Everybody has a role to play in the family. And God has laid out the roles for each individual person, for, each, for everybody in that family. And if we want to have the most successful, happy, best families that we can possibly have today, we're going to want to look through the pages of the Bible and just do things this way. Regardless of what the world's saying, forget about what TV says, forget about the Hollywood, forget about the TV shows and Forget about what everyone else is doing. It doesn't matter. If you trust the Bible to put your salvation on, you're trusting the words of this book, you're trusting that Jesus Christ paid for your sins, and you love that, and you're good with that, hey, let's love the rest of his words too. And let's just look and see what God has laid out for us, whatever it is. And look, all of God's commandments, we're starting with the wives, and, and in today's culture, in today's society, this is going to look down on as a negative sermon. And it's not. It's the farthest thing from a negative sermon. It's actually a positive sermon, but people have gotten their minds warped and twisted today into thinking that somehow the biblical view of how a family should be and what a, wo a wife's role is in that family is, is a negative thing. But that's because Satan's attacking the family. He's, he wants people to think that, oh, this is archaic, and oh, that's so bad, and oh, these women don't have any rights, and oh, these women are, are treated so poorly and stuff. That's not the case at all. But we need to get what the Bible says. If you, hey, if you love God's word, if you believe it to be the truth, then let's just look at it. God is not out looking to make anybody's lives miserable through any of his plan. He gives us knowledge. He gives us this wisdom so that we can understand. You know, I talk to people, you know, a lot of times really worldly unsaved people will be thinking like, oh man, you got to follow all those rules. And they think it's just a drag. Like you got, you can't do anything fun. And that's not it at all. They're so foolish, they don't even understand. I mean, getting involved in all the sin is not that fun anyways. The end of it is, is way worse than any little bit of pleasure you can get for that season. It's, it's nothing. It's vanity and it's worthless. And we understand if you believe God's word, hey, God's not trying to keep you from having fun. There are lots of things that God provides for us that are fun, that can give you joy. I mean, even just having a family is extremely joyful. It's a very great blessing from God. But a lot of these people who want to just only think about themselves and only think about getting drunk or getting high or whatever it is they want to do, fornicate, they're only just self-centered on themselves so much they don't even understand the joy that comes from helping other people out or doing anything nice for someone else and the joy that can come from loving a family and having a family and raising a good, good children. There's a lot of joy that we can get, but we need to do it God's way. He's laid out a path for us. It's not just restrictive, it's a path. And God made every single one of us different. 
God made us uniquely, and in general, God made men and God made women, and he made them differently. I mean, newsflash, men and women are different. These days, they're going to try to tell you that there's no difference and it's just total equality, and men and women are exactly the same. And that anything a man can do, a woman can do, anything a woman can do, a man can do. And that's nonsense. That's ridiculous. I'll tell you right now, I can't have a baby. <laughs> I can't carry a child. And, um, you know, it's always kind of funny when people say, well, we're having a child. She's having a child. I'm not, I'm not having it. There's differences. God gave us roles. God gave us positions. God gave us things that we need to do. Just as we were talking about in an earlier sermon about the members of the church, right? Everybody has a different function to play. Everyone has a different role. Not everybody's the pastor. Not everyone's going to get up here and preach. But everybody has a role, and everybody's role is important. If we're going to have this church and this group thrive and, and get the maximum amount done for God, everyone needs to be in their place doing the things that God has lined up for them to do, right? I mean, our business, the company that I work for, I'm a computer programmer, but we have people, you know, shipping out packages and pulling them and dealing with customers, everybody, doing all these different departments, doing all these different things. We're not all doing the same job. You don't need to hire 20 people all to do the same thing. You get one person for this job, one person for this job, one for, you know, two people for this job, whatever it may be, depending on the size of business or everything. But look, the point of all this is just to say, we need to go into this understanding that, first of all, the, the wife's job is different from the husband's job. They're different. And that's just the way it is, and God made it that way, and it makes sense. Okay? But now let's look and see what is the job of the wife and a little bit of the mother, too, because obviously they go together. But um, Genesis chapter 2 is where we started. This is where woman is created, right? So it's a good place to start. We're going to see here, because God first made Adam. And again, this isn't to say men are better than women or anything like that, but God started off, he created Adam. Now let's look at verse number 18 and see what God thinks about this and what he says. What, after, he, after Adam is, is made... And, and Adam's created, there's Adam. What does God say? Well, in verse 18 it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So the first thing God says is, Look, it's not good for Adam to be alone. He needs companionship. He needs somebody. And not just that, it says, I will make and help meet for him. The first role that we're going to cover for a wife is that the wife is there to help the husband. It's not the other way around. God didn't make Eve and then create Adam to be a help for her. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is it's important to understand this because I get it. Look, the wife's job, especially when she's a mother, is extremely difficult. It is a hard job. She has to raise those children, keep the house, and do all kinds of difficult tasks. Right? It's not an easy job. And we're going to get to the husband's job next week, which is also not an easy task. The husband has all kinds of different things to take care of and all kinds of other chores and other jobs that they're responsible for. Neither one is easy. But the job, the, the, the reason why God created the woman to begin with, it says here, I will make a help meet for him. Now, don't take this the wrong way because I'm not opposed to a husband helping their wife out ever. But what we need to make sure, what wives need to make sure that they're careful of is you're not dependent on your husband and just constantly expecting or demanding help from your husband and doing everything around the house and doing your job. Okay, again, nothing wrong about the husband helping out. If the husband says, hey, can I help you out with something? I would like to help. That's great. And husbands should do that. I mean, if you love your wife, you see him struggling, you see him having a hard time, go ahead and try to help him. But don't, wives, don't hang this over your husband's head and say, well, you never helped me. Because honestly, that's not why God created the man or woman. He created a woman to be the help for the man. And again, it's, it's, it's just what the Bible said. That's why he created them. You know, I'm not going to make an excuse or an apology for it. But it's something that, we ought, that wives, I think, ought to just keep in their mind that, okay, this is my job. If I'm the mother... My primary function is to take care of my children. My primary function is to keep the house. My primary function is to do these things. And we're going to go into that a little bit as we get into the scripture to see what those jobs are. But the primary function of the husband is not to help the wife. 
One of the functions of wife is to help the husband. Okay, and again, it doesn't mean that husband can't help the wife. I'll help my wife out. I love helping my wife out. I'll try to help her out whenever I can. But there are important things that the husband needs to get done and get taken care of. And sometimes, you know, the husband in the position of authority is going to determine, well, we need to focus on this or this or whatever and um, have to direct where all the, the work and effort is going to go. But again, we'll get into that a little bit more when we get into husbands. And you notice here in, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, you know, God started when he, when he was looking for an help. Okay, it's also important to understand this. He created all kinds of animals first, right? He brings all these animals, but none of them, none of them were appropriate help for Adam. None of them were the right thing. So the wife's role is not just to be like a slave or a workhorse. He could have gotten that out of an animal. If it was just if, if her job was just to help like like just to do some labor or something, that's not it. The wife's role is more important like that than that. The help is not just talking about like physical helps of, of, of doing things like that. It's more it's a lot more than that. The wife's role is gonna be more involved of being a companionship and and, and a closeness help um, that's gonna help the husband that way because when Adam saw when God had made woman, she, he made woman out of the rib of his flesh and created woman. And because he did that, he's like, Adam was really pleased. You can tell, it says in verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And it meant, you can tell it meant a lot because the man and wife, husband and wife should be close. They should be very close to each other. And, and this is illustrated in, in God taking a rib and, and bringing the two together, that um, there should be very close companionship here. And a lot of times the help that a husband needs from the wife is really just a, an emotional support and just being there and, and being a help in any way you can to just, to just support him and, and help him out, um, oftentimes just encouraging. But um, it says in verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, Another problem, and this has to do with family, it's not specific to the wives, but I'm going to bring it up tonight. Families are under attack, and one of the problems, it starts off at a very young age when the children are growing up, and it says, for this cause, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave on his wife. Look, you should be going from family to family, and we'll cover this a little bit more in depth when we get into the children, but when we go, um, <coughs> excuse me. God didn't intend for us to go out and, and to just, you turn 18, you're out of the house, and you just start living on your own or living with some other guys or girls or whatever and, and just doing all kinds of whatever because you have no accountability. God created man and woman so that the man can leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and then they too can start their own family and become one flesh. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know the brainwashing has run very deep in our society today. And, and ultimately, you have to decide for yourself. I'm going to try to show you a lot of examples from Scripture. You have to decide for yourself. Do you want to be a godly wife? Do you want to look at what the Scripture says and just believe it and say, you know what, this is what it says and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be someone that adheres to the Bible and not care about what everyone else is doing, not care about what the movies are promoting and just look upon what everyone else is doing. I just want to know what God has laid out for me to do in my life. This is, what I, this is the role I want to follow, and, and that we're going to go through a bunch of scripture tonight, so hopefully you can say it with me. Now look at Genesis chapter 3, one chapter over. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse number 16. This is after Adam and Eve sinned, after they ate of the forbidden fruit, the, the knowledge of good and evil. God has, God has put a curse on him, he curses the snake, and then he says in verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, excuse me, in thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So this is the very first instance where we see this, where we see the, the authority structure being established and being set up, where he says, you know what? The man, the husband is going to rule the household. He's going to rule over you, and your desire is going to be to him. And again, that kind of goes hand in hand with being a help for your husband and your desire being towards your husband. 
That's what God has proclaimed here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. It says, And unto Adam, he said, verse 17, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And he, you know, he curses the ground, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, and um, on and on. <clears throat> but we notice here, and this is the first time this is mentioned, but it's really a recurring theme throughout the Bible. And if you walk away with anything from this sermon, and again, I can't stress enough having the, the proper, <laughs> taking this for what it says, okay? I'm, I'm not going to apologize for any of it, but um, if there's one theme, and it just, the reason why I'm even like stuttering a little bit is because it's so backwards in today's society, and, and people are so prone to just getting angry, and I'm not saying even anyone here tonight is, is like that at all. It's just, it's hard to even comprehend or fathom the way people are so against this type of preaching, and they have so much hatred for this. And I just, just ask that you just listen to what the Bible says and decide for yourself, is this right? Because there is one recurring theme throughout the Bible when it comes to the role of the wife, and that's obedience. Obedience to the husband, obedience to that authority structure. And that seems to be the biggest problem in marriages today is literally that just, just understanding that structure. And it's because people have been just, just pumped full of this brainwashing from Satan from through the, through the music, through the movies, through the television, through everything. And, I mean, unsaved family members, all kinds of people will be coming at you in your life. If you try to live a godly, like a godly wife does, the way that the Bible lays out, you're going to be ridiculed. People are going to be making fun of you. People are going to be saying, trying to put bad, give you bad advice and say, that's, old, you know, that's so old-fashioned. No, you, you have rights too. Hey, you, why is he in charge? Your opinion's important. You should, you know, it's like, look. It's not a matter of good versus bad. It's a matter of what does the Bible say? And that's it. And if you're going to decide to adhere to this, then amen, and God will bless you for it. But if not, God's not going to bless you for it. But I'm going to run through. I've got, we've got a few scriptures we're going to turn to. But just so that you understand this, this importance of obedience and why it's such a recurring theme, I'm just going to quote for you. We're going to turn these. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians 5. And while you're doing that, I'm going to read off. I have these underlined where it, where it talks about this, the level of obedience or submission. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And Ephesians 5.33 says, Reverence her husband. Colossians 3.18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. 1 Peter 3.1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. 1 Timothy 2.11 says, Let the woman learn silence with all subjection. Subjection is, is just, you know, like low, like putting yourself lower. Right, being subject to somebody, you're 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 allow you're putting yourself in a position where you say, okay, someone else is above me, I'm gonna be in subjection. And then in Titus 2 5 says, um, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And we're gonna turn to all these places, but just to give you that one, two, three, four, you know, like five times out of these scriptures where we turn to that are specifically dealing with wives, it's talking about obedience of being in subjection. It's, it's, it's one of the main themes, and I think one of the main themes is because it, it's probably one of the biggest problems. And it's one of those things that, that you know, wives just have to understand their role and where, and where they fit in the family. And the thing is, the reason why this is so important, when you have two heads of a household, you say, okay, we have the husband and the wife, and they have equal authority. They have equal say in every matter. What do you do when you have a conflict? What do you do when the husband wants to do X and the wife wants to do Y? What do you do? Hey, you both have an equal voice. Hey, let's put it to a vote. Well, it's one to one. I mean, what, do you go to the kids and decide what, you know, like, okay, kids, let's, We've, we've got a tie. We need a tiebreaker here. What are we going to do? It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. All it's going to do is going to cause more fights, more strife, more heartache, because when you can't come to agreement and if you can't convince the other person that you're right, then, you know, that when both people think that they're right, you have to go with something. A decision's going to have to be made. 
right? I mean, whatever it may be, whatever the argument is, something's going to have to be done. And that's why God puts one person in charge. And it only makes sense that one person should be, should be in charge. I mean, it's, it, you see that in forms of government. You see that in, in, in businesses. You see that in all other aspects of life. It makes sense to have one person at the top who's kind of in charge and running the show. Now, in the family, God has ordained it, and he spelled it out for us. And he says that the husband is the head of the household. The husband is the one with that authority and is the one in charge. Now, it doesn't mean that the wives can't put in, can't, you know, speak and give her input and, 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 and explain why, you know, things that they want to do and what they do. But at the end of the day, the husband makes the decisions and the wife, you better make sure that you're in subjection and, and, and go along with what your husband says and support him in his decision, even if you disagree with him. And just, and just, no, again, I mean, I'm not talking about things that go against God. So we have to understand the higher powers. God's law is supreme. God's law comes first. Then comes, you know, the, the family or whatever. The structure comes with God at the top. So you need to be in subjection to your, to your husband unless he's telling you specifically to, to do something or disobey God or just, you know, completely just do something that's, that's against what God wants, you know, against what God says. That is the one case where you, you can submit to the higher authority. Because we all are supposed to be in submission to the supreme authority. But beyond that, after that level, there's other levels of authority. And what we're talking about here is the, is the wives being submissive and being, you know, to their own husband. So you're in Ephesians chapter 5. The, the section in verse 22 starts with the, with the wives section of Ephesians 5. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And that's important to notice that there because he's saying, look, how much do you submit yourself unto God? If you're submitting yourself unto God completely, hey, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's the, that's the level of submission you should have. So, you know, when, when these decisions come up or whatever, your husband says, this is the way it's going to be. Would you argue with God about that? How submissive would you be to, the, you know, to, to God? And that's the way that you ought to treat. And I'm not calling your husband God, but the Bible here says, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I'm not making that up. I mean, this is what it says. And that's what it means is that, look, you need to just to just be able to go with what your husband says. When your husband just says, look, this is this is what we're doing, this is the way it is. He's the one that's making the rules in the house. It says in verse 23, for the husband it explains it a little bit, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Not in some things, not in a few things, it's in everything. So the same way that our church, this church, Word of Truth Baptist Church, is subject unto Christ. And I pray God that we are completely subject unto Christ in all things. That's our goal. That's what we're striving for. Well, the same way that this church is going to be in subjection to Christ is the same way that the wives ought to be in subjection to their own husbands. Look at, jump down to verse 32 of Ephesians 5. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence is basically showing respect. And I'll give you women a little bit of insight on, on men, because the way that men operate is very, very simple. You women are a lot more complicated than men. Men are very simple. Men, ultimately, the husbands, what they want is respect. They want to be able to, to say something. They're in charge. God has given us naturally these attributes as men to be leaders, to be, you know, and we need to work on those sometimes and work on those skills to become better leaders, but God has innately given us these types of qualities or these types of attributes, and men want to be respected. When you say something, you want it to have weight, you want it to have meaning, and you want your wife to be able to listen to you and follow that. Now, wives typically want to be loved. They want the affection. And that's, again, we're going to get into that with the husbands because one of the main functions of the husband is to love your wife. Even as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. 
But in this instance, look, men want to be respected. That's why the Bible says that you reverence your husband. And it's important too because when God has God ordained marriage, and people tend to just kind of ignore this, especially with the amount of divorce these days. Marriage, he's like likening the mar like marriage between a man and a woman with, with Christ and the church and, and the way that, that God loves us and the way that God has given himself for us when we're considered the bride of Christ. And there's all this symbolism and it's all this great truth. And when you take something that's holy and sanctified like marriage and you defile it and you just get divorced and you just put away, you're, you're, you're completely ruining this imagery, this picture that God's given to us about his love for us and he'll never leave us or forsake us. And, and, and all these things. He loved us so much that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. You know, he is in that, that figure of the husband in the relationship that we have with God. So the same way, that's why he's saying the same way that we would submit to God. If, that, if our marriage is going to be a picture of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and just us personally and with our salvations and things like that, our marriage ought to glorify that and ought to reflect the same level of, you know, for the wives would be the same level of submission that we would have unto God. And for the husbands, the same level of love that Christ had for you when he paid for your sins on the cross. And by, by following and adhering to a godly marriage and listening to what the Bible has played out, it, it, I mean, it goes a lot deeper than just personalities and just, and just oh, well, you just want to be in charge and... And so you can be a dictator and you can just do whatever. No, no, that's not it at all. Anyone who thinks that you're totally missing the point. Now, if you would, I mean, you don't even have to turn it. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Colossians 3.18 is basically, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 are kind of parallel passages. They cover the same exact thing. Colossians 3.18 just says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. It, essentially exactly what we saw in Ephesians 5. But turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3. And again, I mean, you're going to, this is repetitive. It gets repetitive, but that's why, I mean, it's, it's kind of the main theme when we're talking about the wives. And I didn't cherry pick these verses of like, I'm going to find all the verses that have to do with wives and I'm only going to preach on these ones. I'm not doing that. I mean, go and search for yourself. Look what the Bible, when it, what the Bible talks about the family, when it talks about husbands, when it talks about wives. Look up for yourself every single time you can find these things in the Bible. I'm trying to go to all of them that are in any way relevant to, to, to us, you know, understanding what the proper roles are for husbands and wives. And we're going to find next week, we're going to be going to almost the exact same scripture that we are tonight for the wives. We're going to be going to right exactly the same places for the husbands because the Bible only deals with this in certain sections of the Bible. And um, we find these the most clear instructions here in the, in the places that we're going to. So look at 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. Again, if it's repetitive, it's just, I mean, think about that. If it's repetitive, it's repetitive for a reason. If it's in God's word, it's in God's word for a reason. Verse number 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word may be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting out of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now we're going to stop here real quick. Because we see now more attributes and more things besides just the subjection and just the obedience to the husband. Because he says one of the reasons why it's important is likewise he wives to be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wife. So the wife should be keeping good conversation for one. When you're, when you're living a godly you know, wife example... Other people will see that. Other people that, that don't obey the word, other people that don't see that, they're going to see that and they're going to they're going to take notice of it. Guaranteed. People take notice of our marriage. I mean, whether it be family members or other people who kind of know us or get to know us and just kind of see the way things go, they, they pay attention to that. Now, they might be unsaved, but over time, a lot of times, people can see these things and it makes an impact on them. 
and, and they, they start to realize, you know, because at first they'll just be like, oh, that's crazy, that's terrible, you know, it's just such a shock to them. But after the shock wears off, and they can see how it works, and then, and, you know, and then they'll start to be like, oh, well, your husband's just a jerk, and, and you know, he's just on a power trip, and all this other stuff, and they'll, and they'll start to hate the husband. But then they'll start looking at it more. And then just, just as they get to know you, and you see things more, like, oh, well, I mean, it's going to be hard to die. Like, if, if your husband's in the proper role, you're going to be saying, hey, he actually loves his wife. And, hey, the wife's in her role, and she's actually happy. And she likes it. And, you know, and they're going to start seeing this stuff. And then it says that, you know, it says that without the word, maybe won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear. So wives, make sure that your conversations are chaste. Chaste is like pure. Okay? It means you're not talking, you're not making dirty jokes. You know, even just like 50 or 60 years ago, in society, it was really looked down upon when a woman would make some kind of like a dirty joke or a sexual joke or something of that nature. It was like, I mean, that was taboo. Women didn't do that. Now, men would do that, and it's still wrong for men to do that, but the society in general used to have a much more established, you know, family, what women should be doing, and what men should be doing as the roles. It was a lot more righteous than it is today. Today we have women, I mean, there, there's cursing and all kinds of filth coming out of women's mouths these days, and it's disgusting. It ought not so to be. Men shouldn't be doing it either, but it's disgusting what's coming out of women's mouth. The Bible says, behold your chaste conversation, and that's coupled with fear. You know what it's a fear of? It's a fear of God. It's a fear that, um, that you shouldn't be doing these things. God has commanded you to keep your conversations pure. And that goes on Facebook, that goes out of your mouth, that goes wherever. Don't be making these, these jokes and these innuendos and all these things. Keep your conversation chaste. Chaste means pure. Everything that comes out of your mouth, your children ought to be able to hear what they're saying. That's purity. Verse 3, who's adorning, now it's going to talk about the apparel of women, what women wear. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. So he's saying, look, your outward appearance, don't be so concerned about how good you look, like, like doing all these fancy things with your hair and, and wearing gold and putting ornaments on and basically kind of making a show of yourself because that's ultimately what it is. And I know women don't necessarily look at it this way, but it's what it is. And when the Bible talks about modesty and wearing modest apparel, modest means you're not drawing attention to yourself. Oftentimes we'll talk about modesty in like, you know, low cut shirts. And yes, that's immodest. When you're drawing attention to your breasts, that's immodest. But it's not just that. It goes beyond that. When you're wearing like all kinds of fancy jewelry and you're decking yourself out and you're doing all these things. Now look, every husband wants their wife to look great, but, but I think every husband would agree their wife probably does look great the way that she is. I know I love my wife exactly the way she is. She doesn't have to go and doll herself up and do all kinds of things and put makeup on and do all the stuff for me to think that she looks great. I already do. And um, the Bible's saying, look, because what that's going to do anyways, when you get too concerned with your outward appearance, it's vanity and, and it's going to, you know, your focus is on the wrong thing. That's why he says, what you should be concerned with in verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So he says, look, wives, if you have a meek, a quiet spirit, you're not just obnoxious, you're not just loud and going out and saying these things and, and not having chase conversation and you just rattle off and say that, whatever filth comes out of your mouth, you're not being meek, you're not being quiet, you don't have that type of a spirit. That's wrong, but God says if you do have that, He says that's great price in God's eyes. If you want God to look at you and see a lot of value and say, wow, here's a woman that, that, that is worth a lot. Here's a woman that's of great price. He's looking at a woman that has a meek and quiet spirit. Okay, And that's something that, that, that I believe that you can change if you're not that way right now. Otherwise, I don't think God would be saying it like this if it was something you have absolutely no control over. And um, 
again, I mean, this is the word of God in Second Peter, or First Peter three four. That's what God thinks. God thinks it's of great price. Verse number five. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection under their own husbands. So he's saying, look. This meek and quiet spirit that he's talking about, that's of great price to God. He says the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves with that meek and quiet spirit. They adorned themselves with that chaste conversation. And here it says, and it also brings up being in subjection under their own husbands. Again, I mean, it just brings it up right there that that's, that was a high quality to possess, being in subjection to their own husband. And they bring up this example of Sarah with Abraham in 1 Peter 3, 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, Lord is like the boss. I mean, she's calling him, she's giving him that respect and calling him Lord. Now, the interesting about this thing, when you look through the Bible and you try to find out where did Sarah even call Abraham Lord, it's in Genesis 18, 12. I'll read this for you. It says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now what's interesting about that is that she's not saying it specifically to Abraham like, Lord this or Lord that. Which, I mean, whatever, it wouldn't matter either way if she was saying that. I mean, she's addressing him with respect, fine. But what, what's really interesting about this is that with Sarah, it, she said it within herself, which means she wasn't even just doing it for a show. This is something that was already in her heart. God can view that. He sees this woman honestly has a respect for her husband. This woman is honestly in subjection to her husband, and she's calling him Lord even in her own heart. No one else can hear that. No one else knows that. The only reason we know that today is because it's recorded in the Bible that she said that within her heart. But that's the attitude that she had. That was the amount of subjection they had. And that's why she's being praised here in 1 Peter chapter 3 as an extremely godly, righteous woman. It's because of what happened in Genesis 18, 12 within her heart. This is the attitude that the wife ought to have. If you want to be a godly wife, if you want God to look at you, say, hey, there's a woman of great value. The Bible emphasizes just being in submission, being obedient to your husband, and having a meek and a quiet spirit so far. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We're going to see a little bit more. And honestly, there's... There's really not that much content covered here. A lot of the stuff is repetitive, but it's, but it's not that much specifics that like you have to focus on. I mean, you can take it for what it is, but I think that's kind of good news. You don't have to be worried about doing a hundred different things to be right with God as, as being a godly wife. There's really only a very few things that he, that he even brings up and talks about. So that should even make it easier. You just feel like, you know, I'm just going to say focus on this. I'm going to say focus that I'm... That I'm making sure that I'm being the obedient wife that I'm supposed to be, or that I'm, you know, not adorning myself with all the jewels and decking things out. Um, look at this first, first Timothy chapter number two and verse number nine. It says, "In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel." So again, we're talking about modesty with shamefacedness and sobriety. Sobriety, is seriousness, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array getting the most expensive things to put on for a show. And you know what it is. I mean, the name brand stuff, the only reason people wear that stuff, it's not because it's the only thing that looks that good. Oftentimes, you have these name brands, and it's like a solid color of whatever, like a shirt or, or something. And it's $50 or $100. And the only reason is just because of that little badge, that little name tag that says it's some designer thing. And it's, it's meaningless. It's vanity. It's stupidity, in my opinion. <laughs> it's stupidity. But... Um, he said here, you know, the woman don't get caught up in that stuff. It's nonsense. It's vain. It's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. You know, so we left off with costly array. Verse 10, it says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So he's saying, look, don't worry about your outward appearance and all this stuff. You know, take care of yourself, but don't get caught up in, in making yourself looking so pretty. He says, rather, have good works. That is way more valuable. Good works. Training your children properly. 
you know, being a good wife and going out and serving the Lord in whatever capacity you can. Reading your Bible, praying for people, soul winning, whatever it is, hey, those are great works. Those are good works. That is way more important than being concerned about these other meaningless, vain things. Like, like what you're going to wear and how, you, and, and how you look. It doesn't matter. He says in verse number 11, now, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, here we get... Um, it's not even necessary. This isn't necessary for just for wives, but wives are women. So when it covers here about the woman learning in silence without subjection, when we come in church, you know the church is a congregation. We gather together, we fellowship, we sing. But the learning time is really during the preaching. That is when it's time to learn. The Bible says that the woman is supposed to learn in silence with all subjection. Now, I've been in many churches where. The women will shout up and pipe up and just be like, amen, amen, and just piping in and saying whatever. That is unscriptural. That is unbiblical. And the women should not be doing that. Now, if a man decides to, to, to voice his agreement with what's being said, that's different because the restriction isn't put in place against men. But the Bible says that the woman is to learn in silence. That means without speaking, with all subjection. And then he says, but I suffered not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. Again, referring to the authority structure that God has created. God says, look, I don't want the woman usurping authority, make, you know, making their authority above uh, the authority of the man because that's not the way God lined it out. That's not the way he intended it. He says, but to be in silence. So we will never have a woman come up here to teach. The Bible would never have someone, a woman come up here to be a pastor or an assistant pastor or even come up and, and do any kind of teaching when the church is gathered together because the scripture flat out says that the women are supposed to learn silence. And it says, um, and I don't even know if I have the, in this, it says, but if they will learn anything, they can ask their husbands at home. And that's going to go again with the husbands where the husband needs to be the spiritual leader in the house because the wife ought to be able to come to the husband when there's a question about the Bible, and the husband ought to be able to answer that and be able to provide that type of leadership for his role in the marriage. But um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself with next week's sermon. Um, and then he gives an explanation of this too. 1 Timothy 2, we read verses 11 and 12 about the woman learning in silence. He goes in verse 13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And again, we touched on that earlier First Adam was formed, and then the woman was made as it helped me form. And then he says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So he says, look, when Adam sinned, he didn't sin because he was fooled. He didn't sin because he was tricked. Now, the woman, Eve, sinned in the Garden of Eden because she was deceived by the serpent. The serpent beguiled her. The serpent tricked her. Into, into, into basically into taking and eating of the fruit that they were told not to eat of. But Adam wasn't. Adam knew it was wrong. Adam did not have this, this, oh, well, maybe it is okay type of a moment. He already saw that his wife had done it, and he just did it. We don't know exactly the motivation. I mean, you can guess on what the motivation is of why Adam would even do it. I mean, maybe the fact that his wife already sinned and God had commanded him not to do it, and he was sticking with her. I don't know. Um, but he wasn't deceived about it. He knew what he was doing. And it says um, in verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So the woman being an authority and the woman being um, like teachers in church, one of the reasons why God does that is because it's easier for women to get deceived than it is for men. And it's just the way that he made us. It's, it's in women's nature. They're a little bit more trusting than men. They're a little bit more, I mean, just with the nurturing and with the empathy and the sympathy and all the things that, that women have that are great attributes of women that, that, that are just natural and instinctual to them are also attributes that will make them a little bit more prone to being deceived. Um, that's why when the Bible talks about, about false prophets, and I think it's in Jude where it says, leading about silly women you know, laden with sins. And he and leads captive silly women laden with sins. It's talking about the women being, you know, 
basically deceived into their false doctrine. And I think that's in support of what, of what it's explained here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Turn, if you would, to chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're almost done. Um, like I said, there's only, there's only one more place after 1 Timothy 5 we're going to turn to. 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, But the younger widows refuse. For when we have begun to wax what? When they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry having damnation because they cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, yeah. and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. As a woman or as a wife, I mean, this is talking about widows. Wives will probably be more busy than this, so it shouldn't be as big of a deal. But still, it's in, it's in more in, in a woman's nature than as a man. Were to be like when they get idle, to wander about from house to house and just kind of get involved in other people's business. It says, be tattlers, busybodies, and then you're going to end up speaking things that you ought not to speak. You're going to be saying things you ought not to, get involved in other people's matters. And it's and, and you know it, I mean, you know women like this where it's just, they're always getting into drama, there's always things going on because they're not keeping their nose out of other people's business. They get idle, they've got nothing to do, so now they're going to start going on and oh, did you hear what so-and-so is doing and just kind of gossiping and spreading rumors? Women, try to avoid this. Be aware. I mean, it's, it's part of your nature. I get it, but, but be aware of it and try not to let this um, affect you, especially if you, have, if you have nothing to do. If, you, if, you have, if you're a woman that finds yourself having like extra time or having free time, don't let yourself get idle because the Bible's warning that these types of things will happen when you're idle. And these days, it's, it's even easier to, to get involved with this with the internet and with Facebook because there's so much of this garbage that goes on. And I, you know, I, I barely ever even get on the stupid thing anymore. I use it to pump my agenda and just <laughs> to show people things that I think they ought to see. But what a lot of people use this stuff for is to just get involved in other people's business and just looking around and just, and just you know, whether it be stalking or whatever it is, you get idle, you get to be tattlers. Oh, did you see so-and-so did this or so-and-so said this? And you start talking about people behind their backs. And look, it's sin, it's wrong, and you shouldn't be doing it. If you have time on your hands, spend it wisely, read the Bible, do more things for God, walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We read that this morning. So just be aware of it. It says, um, and then finishing off here, Speaking things that they ought not, verse 14, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So he's saying, you need to walk upright, uprightly. Don't let the enemy, don't let the adversary give, have an opportunity. Don't give them an occasion to speak reproachfully against you, which means you're not going to be idle, you're not going to be tattlers, you're not going to be busybodies. You're going to be busy at home marrying. And this is advice for younger women. I mean, this is for the widows, but just for younger women in general. Marry, bear children, have kids, guide the house, and do every do all the work involved with that, and just don't give people an opportunity to speak reproachfully on you. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. is the last place we're going to turn tonight. Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. Right after the first and second Timothy is Titus. Titus chapter number two. We're going to start reading in verse number three of Titus chapter two. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Now this is talking about, you know, older women in the church. Not false accusers. You're not just bringing up accusations. You're not making up lies about people. Not giving to much wine. You're not drunk. You're not drinking at home and getting, you know, getting drunk. Teachers of good things. So women can be teachers. We saw earlier that, you know, the women's supposed to learn in silence with all subjection. That's in the church. Okay? But women are still teachers. And it, it makes sense when women have children, 
You're going to be, that's the primary source that the children should be learning from is from their mother. The husband's job is a little bit different. Mom needs to be teaching those children. She needs to be a teacher of good things. If you're keeping yourself holy, if you're keeping yourself busy, keeping yourself in the word of God, keeping yourself knowing these things, asking your husband questions if you have questions about things, but keeping yourself moving forward, you'll be able to teach those things also then to your children and give them to you. And uh, you don't have to turn there, but in the virtuous woman, we're not going to go there tonight because this is a little bit more geared towards wives specifically. So we're going to the chapters that talk about wives. But in Proverbs, let me turn there real quick. Proverbs 31 is the last chapter in the book of Proverbs. The Bible says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So here we see that, and then it goes on and on, and it talks about the virtuous woman and how her, her price is far above rubies and all these things. And, and who to look for in a wife. And um, you know what? We, we're going we're gonna to have to go there because it, it kind of does have to do with wives since that's who he's supposed to be looking for. Um, well, let's finish off Titus chapter 2 and we'll get into this. I got into this because you know, the, the woman, the wife is supposed to be teachers of good things. And here we see in Proverbs 31 that, that she was able to teach her son, Lemuel, a prophecy, which is preaching basically. It's God's word. She was, she was teaching him the prophecy. Um, and it says in verse 4 of Titus 2, I'm, I'm going to finish this up real quick, that they may teach the young women to be sober. So the older women are supposed to be teaching the younger women as well. Not this, just their own children, but teaching the, other, the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. Again, there's a word chaste, pure. Um, discretion is discreet. You're using discretion. Um, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So if you're not doing these things, if you're not loving your husband, if you're not loving your children, if you're not being discreet and chaste and keepers at home and good and obedient to your own husbands, then the Bible's saying that the word of God is being blasphemed. So again, take that to heart. When, when If you have a, a problem in any of these areas, that God looks at as you're blaspheming his word. If you're not keeping these things. Now let's turn real quick. We're we'll close with Proverbs 31. We're almost done. If all women, this is, this is a great example of a godly woman here in Proverbs 31. And we're going to close with this. I'm not going to do too much preaching on this, but we'll kind of read through it. Um, it starts in verse 3. She's, she's, this woman, this mom is telling her son, give not thy strength unto women. So again, I mean, this is a godly woman giving advice saying don't give your strength unto women because the man is supposed to be the strong one. The man is the one that's in charge. The man is the one that has the authority in the household. It's not the woman. She says, give not thy strength unto women nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And she goes on about strong drink. And then um, verse number 10 says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Again, talking about how much God values a virtuous woman and how much a virtuous woman should be worth to us. Far above rubies. Rubies are expensive. And he's saying, look, the value, the value of a virtuous woman is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Make sure that your husband can trust you and has trust in you. The way that you do that is, is by living a life of example where you're faithful you're true to your husband. You're not giving any type of reason for your husband to, to, to doubt what you're doing or, or to, you know, I mean, if you have a bunch of guy friends and you're always on the phone with them, you're always talking to them, hey, your husband's not going to be very trustworthy of you. I don't think a husband's going to safely trust in someone where they're always out talking to other guys and stuff like this. Keep track of what you're doing. Make sure that your husband can and does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. There's no reason for the husband to go out. And again, in today's world, right, we see lots of divorces. And the reason for this is because we've strayed from God's plan. When, when, the, woman is, when the wife is being submissive and under subjection to the husband and is living a righteous life 
and the husband is loving her husband, you're not going to have divorce. But um, she's saying here, look, if, if, the, if the woman is doing her job, the husband's going to have no need of spoil. He's going to have no need to go out and get anything else. The husband's not going to be looking upon anyone else. Why would he want to look at anyone else if you're doing all these things that we've already read that are laid out? I mean, the husband's gonna, I mean, there's, there's no way you could find anything better. Than having someone who respects you, someone that listens to you, someone who's doing hard work, training your children, and doing all of these good things, the husband would be a fool to to even think that they'd want to have anyone else or anything else in their life. If the woman, if the wife is doing their job, though, they could help prevent that from happening. And again, it's not justifying the husband for any type of wickedness or sin. All I'm saying is that the more and the closer you get to living your role responsibly or your role better. It's just going to be better off for your marriage in general, just overall. Even if one person or the other isn't quite fulfilling their role properly, the more, the best that you can fill your role, it's going to be way better for your marriage. And God will bless you for that. Verse number 12, it says, She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Well, there's good advice. Don't, don't do your husband evil. <laughs> do him good. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. It's not It's not a drudgery. She's working willingly. It's something that she wants to do. Hey, I'm going to work with my hands. I'm going to get something done. This is an attitude that the wife has. She's not lazy. She's not idle. She's a hard worker. There's a lot of stuff to be done here. Working willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar, so she's very resourceful. She riseth also while as yet night and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. So here, she's getting up early, and it says later, she's staying up late. She's doing a lot of hard work. She's making sure that everybody's taken care of. She's not putting herself first. She's thinking, you know what? My job, I'm going to get up. I'm going to make food for everyone. I'm going to make breakfast for everyone, and make sure everybody's taken care of. Even while it's still like, even if it means I'm going to be tired, even if it means it's going to be difficult, I'm going to get up and do this stuff. This is the virtuous woman. She considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. Again, she's working with her hands. She planteth a vineyard. And these are all things that are done, that can be done while keeping the home and while keeping the house. Things that are done on your property, things that you've done around your house. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. A woman doesn't have to be completely weak physically. She should be strong in the sense of that if she's doing a lot of hard work, she'll naturally be strong. Now, she's not going to be as strong as a husband. And husband, you better make sure that your wife's not stronger than you. You should be doing a lot harder work than she's doing. But look, the virtuous woman here is doing, she's girds her loins with strength, strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night, even though she's getting up while it's still night, getting up early. Her candle's not going out by night. She's still staying up. She's still enduring and doing the things that need to be done. She layeth her hands to the spindle, verse 19, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She has compassion. She's not, again, all throughout this whole list so far, nowhere do you see the, the virtuous woman saying, well, what about me? What about my time? What about what I get to do? This? What about my breaks? What about my vacation? What about my doing all this stuff? She's always concerned about everyone else and, and putting the needs of others in front of her own and getting up early, what well, that means getting up early, that means staying up late, that means stretching out her hand to the poor, even just, just helping other people out, not even in her, in her own household, just, just, just having that type of a heart to help other people out that are in need. She reaches forth her hands to the needy, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet, she's made clothing. She's made sure that her family is prepared against the environment, against anything that's going to come the way, whether it be snow, rain, whatever. She's got them taken care of. She's not afraid of it. She's already taken care of it in advance. She didn't wait until all of a sudden, hey, there's snow and ice on the ground. I better do something about this. She had it taken care of in advance. That's why she's not afraid of it. It's already planned. It's already taken care of. She's already worked hard for it. Verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he said among the elders of the land, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. 
and she shall rejoice in time to come. The reward is going to come. But with women and with wives, it's going to come later. It doesn't come immediately. And that's with most things in life in general anyways and with serving God. You don't typically get your rewards right away. You work, you work, you work your hands off, you do whatever it is you need to do, and later you will reap the benefit. You will reap the reward. God will make sure that you're taken care of. She openeth her mouth, verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Well, if she's doing all these things, I don't see how she could be eating the bread of idleness. Because this is a lot of work already that the virtuous woman is doing. It says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Look, if you want, if you want to have this love and affection from your, from your family, from your children, from your husband, you're doing all these things. There, I cannot see. You'd have, to be, you'd have to be a real jerk not to appreciate and not to praise your wife when she's already working this hard and doing all these things for you. And she's filling this role. It says, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Again, beauty is vanity. Don't, be, don't get caught up in, in how you, your outward appearance is. It says, But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So women, I don't think this is a negative sermon, honestly. And it's not just because, oh, well, you're the man and, and you're the one in authority. No. I think that God has laid it out. Enjoy being a woman. Enjoy the fact that you don't have to have the same job that the husband does. Because we're going to get on the husbands next week and you're going to find out, hey, the husband's job isn't easy either. The wife's job is not easy. And I get that. And we can see that. We see the virtuous woman here doing all kinds of tasks, being strengthened because she's doing so many things, getting up early, staying up late, doing all kinds of work. But you know what? The husband's job isn't easy either. Embrace your role. There's no reason to be, to be bitter against the job that you have in front of you as a wife. You have enough work to worry about. Don't be worried about wanting to take on the extra work of, 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 of may, being, having to be the one responsible for making the decisions for the family. That's a burden in and of itself that you don't need and you don't have time for. If you're doing all the things that, that God has already laid out for you to do, you don't need any extra work to add to that. And um, embrace being feminine. Embrace being a woman. Embrace all these attributes that God has given unto you for, as a wife. You will have so much more joy in your marriage and in your life in general if we can just follow God's plan. Let's bow our heads and word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, you give us instructions on how we should live our day-to-day -day lives, dear God, and, and these simple plans. There's not very many rules and there's not very many things that we need to follow. Ultimately, it's really not that difficult. I mean, it's difficult for us with the sinful flesh that we have in trying to, to do it. But it's not like you've given us some inordinate amount of, of laws and restrictions and rules that we have to follow. It's really basic. We just need to make sure that we're diligent in, in, in monitoring our own selves and our own walk with God, dear God. I pray that you would please just work in the, in the, in the lives of all the wives that were under the sound of the preaching tonight. That, that they'd all be able to walk away with something. That they'd be able to change about themselves, whatever it may be, dear God, to be to be better in your sight, that you can look down and you can value them very highly based on their, their meek and quiet spirit and their, their submission and obedience and the role that they're filling, dear Lord. And even if it's not being fulfilled just for their husband, but, but just for the fact that you commanded it and you told them to do it, dear God, and I pray that you would please just help us as husbands to learn what we need to learn next week and um, that you would just bless our marriages, help us as Christians to be a good, godly example for this world and not to succumb to the pressure of this world because it is different, dear Lord. But we know that, that we don't have the same divorce statistics from people who are actually going to listen to your word and obey it because there would be no reason um, um, if, we're, if we're following your will and following your word that, that anyone should ever get divorced, dear Lord. You know what's best for us. 
and help us just to, to follow and obey what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.